speaker and colleagues for recognizing uh, that both uh, matters uh, relate to transportation and therefore we'll try to do the two of them uh, together. I promise that this will not be a very long debate. Uh, one essentially is a validation bill. Uh, and what it essentially is doing is validating the monies that were collected um, for uh, bus fares. You would know that when the Minister of Finance speaks in a particular budget and gives an increase in a tax or a fare or a fee, that you have a period of time on which to actually bring that legislation. And if that legislation is not brought within that period of time, then a validation bill is required. And that is what the Transport Authority Validation Bill 2020 seeks to do, to be able to bring into actual law the changes that occurred in bus fares from the time of the financial statement to the present time. And that is, bas that is all basically the validation bill does, and I would ask that, that we would consider it as such. The more important matter is the Public uh, Transport Miscellaneous Provisions Bill. And what that bill is, is, is uh, seeking to do is to be able to give some teeth to the Transport Authority. When the Transport Authority was first put in place in 2008, um, latter part of 2007, I believe it was under the then uh, member for St. George North, the current member for St. George North, the part, apart from the bill, which then became the act, for, which brought the Transport Authority into life, there was supposed to be an additional regulations which accompanied that. Unfortunately, those regulations were never put in place. And the Transport Authority uh, has met with us on several occasions, together with other stakeholders in the transport sector, be it the public service vehicles and the transport board, and we've come up with a series of regulations. Because clearly, we could not have the Transport Authority being asked to regulate the sector without those regulations being in place. And unfortunately, before we can actually get to put those regulations before this Honorable House, there is a requirement to bring three other bills together and to be able to synchronize and harmonize them. And that is what the Public Transport Miscellaneous Provisions Bill does. So in other words, in order to bring the regulations, we first have to bring this miscellaneous bill. And that is what we are seeking to do so that then the ministry will be in a position to actually bring the regulations. So it is not a, a long bill, but essentially what it does is it gives us the opportunity to bring the regulations and put the regulations in force so that we have the miscellaneous bill. So it brings together the Road Traffic Act, the Road Traffic Regulations, and the Transport Authority Act. And by changes to those uh, particular uh, acts, that gives us the opportunity to bring the regulations into fact. And we all know that the public service vehicles in Barbados have had, let's say, a checkered past. And we appreciate very much the work that all the public service vehicle people do. You have to understand, uh, Mr. Speaker, that at times we only have 60, 70 transport buses on the road. But there are 600, 500, 600, sometimes 650 public service vehicles on the road. And they are our partners in transport, and we appreciate the good work that they do, the vast majority of them. But some of them sometimes flout the law. Some of them sometimes are off-route. They stop at appropriate places that are not designated bus stops. They overload the vehicles, and by so doing, they contravene the insurance that, they, that is required for them to transport the public. So what the regulations seek to do is to try to rein in that bad behavior and bring that bad behavior to an end so that we can have a better control and better understanding of the sector. And essentially, what the regulations will do when we actually come into force once we get this uh, miscellaneous uh, bill through both houses, and then we get the certification of the um, Attorney General. What the regulations will essentially do, and the biggest part of the regulations, is what you'd have heard me speak about in the past as the three-strike rule. 
And what the three-strike rule is and will be, Mr. Speaker, is essentially if you contravene any particular part of the regulations, you get three chances to contravene. First strike, you will get a fine. Uh, the amount, I, I don't recall. I think it may have been $1,000, something in that range. If you ha contravene it on a second time, then you get a second strike and another fine. And then the third time you contravene, you will lose your permit or your driver's license. And there will be certain regulations there specific for owners and certain regulations specific for drivers. And that way, and, and let me say that the genesis of this actually came from the Trinidad uh, legislation. And we looked at the Trinidad legislation when we first looked at the, at the road traffic regulations. And we found that the Trinidad regulations were actually even more stringent and they required after two contraventions of the law that you would lose your permit. And that would be lose your permit for life. Not lose your permit and get it back after a year. Your permit was gone. Now, we're after meeting with the stakeholders in the, in the sector, we decided that, and together with the Prime Minister, we decided that that was a little tough and difficult and it would not be a full, complete loss of your permit or your license. And also, rather than, than a two-strike rule, we would have gone to a three-strike rule. And we had full, full agreement from, from all of the uh, players in the sector. And we are ready now in, in a position to actually bring the regulations once we can get the miscellaneous, this uh, miscellaneous bill through both houses. And that is essentially uh, what it will be. The biggest part of it will be the regulations because we recognize that we have to bring control to the sector. We appreciate the work that the public service vehicles have been doing, especially at this time in this COVID environment. We recognize that they've been under significant strain as well with the 60% rule of, of capacity and occupancy. And I've been advised by the Minister of Health and we're looking to see what we can do to improve that. And we're in significant discussions and I, I hope and I, I believe that he will soon be able to make an announcement very shortly about that occupancy um, level. Because at the end of the day, as and everybody keeps saying, we're in this together. But we are in this together. Because just as I have to be your keeper and you have to be my keeper, those people that are essential service providers, of which people in the front line of it, work in the transport, meeting people every day, transporting essential workers, transporting children as, as they go back to school, transporting construction workers to and from home, work and play and to supermarket or whatever, doctor, whatever it is, they are absolutely critical to the, the whole infrastructure and the, the, the way that this society is set up. And therefore, Mr. Speaker, I would commend that we support both of these bills, both the one, of course, for the bus fares, which is housekeeping and the second one is to be able to put the regulations into effect and I therefore ask that these uh, bills do not pass and read a second time. Take a second. You have to do them one at a time sir. Okay. Mr. Speaker I therefore ask that the public transport miscellaneous provisions bill be read a second time. Take a second mm -hmm. I remember for us the Michael Rex. Thank you very much Mr. Just a little bit of noise. <laughs> you didn't hear that? No, your microphone. I didn't speak. I didn't make enough noise. Because you did make enough noise, but your 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 Just speaker was a there. little bit of noise, um, Mr. Speaker. Now, public. I remember Mr. Michael South you turn off your public the, the, the member for St. Michael's South feels as long as I'm on my feet, his microphone should be on too. Because he identifies with me in vital ways. I remember that's to make a contribution or to or to be confrontational or to no, adhere or not. I just want to, that is to make to, a contribution that or is to, support, to oppose a contribution. That is to support me in my contribution. We go back a long way, Mr. Speaker. And all good times. Public transport, Mr. Speaker, you know, is, is a 
social service is a social good, but it's also very essential, it's vital, it's an essential critical input into facilitating economic activity in Barbados. And if for no other reason, that is why we must get it right with respect to state and its involvement in the public transport sector in Barbados. I want to repeat a call that I made some time ago that the state withdraw itself from commercial aspects of public transport in Barbados and that the state see its obligation to provide for that service in so far as facilitating the movement of school children and the like. But in terms of being involved in what I call the commercial aspects of providing that public service generally, I believe very strongly that the state should withdraw from that. State should facilitate private sector development of that area of economic activity and should confine itself, but meaningfully so, and seriously so, and obviously so, to regulation, not just to talk about it, but to properly regulate the sector. I believe that the state must commit to an element of subsidy. If the state withdraws, I imagine that studies will show that monies will be saved. But even in withdrawing, if the state can commit to subsidizing to some measure private operators to provide a universal public transport service in Barbados, I believe that savings will still be made. Absolutely necessary is the business of concessions. The sector has been asking for that unheard for years. To reduce the cost of operations rather than give an attentive ear to acceding to the request for such concessions, the state in the last couple of years has imposed some further financial burden on the sector. So I'm suggesting very strongly that the state withdraws from providing the public service as a social good in the universal terms in which it seeks to do and incorporate the private interests in so doing in a context of strong and obvious regulation, not just stated or documented regulations, obvious regulation, allowing for the savings of the costs associated with its involvement right now through means of subsidy to the sector that the universal service could be still provided, that fellows would not think they cannot operate at certain hours on certain routes and going into certain distant places in Barbados. If that is subsidized, I believe private interests can feel a motivation to go. If you don't subsidize that, then they will not go. If they don't go, then the transport board, the state entity, has to provide the service. And to me, at a greater cost than if you offer a subsidy. And a third pillar of this first proposal point is that we need to give a bit more considered air to the matter of concessions to reduce the cost to operators in the private sector. Mr. Speaker, whether we want to admit it or not, bus fares are killing when the poorer sections of the public in Barbados Bus fares are, you hear this in Semica Central. I hear this in Semica West. I pass through Semica West for one reason or another. Every day. 
for those who wonder and ponder and who might want to suggest otherwise every single day. And they perchance I don't find St. Michael West, St. Michael West finds me, even up here. But I'm saying that bus fares are killing. Whether you come out of South St. Michael or St. Lucie at the northernmost point of this place, you know that bus fares are killing. It's a story not sounded with frequency or loudness much anymore these days, but it's a truth which remains that bus fares are killing. And they may come at me if they will, and whosoever they be. But perhaps in attempting to provide a greater base of financial support for state operations, if it becomes still necessary after you withdraw from universal state, providing universal state service in Barbados, if it still becomes necessary that government's coffers be supplemented and we understand very clearly that the 350 in bus fare does not take the transport board where it ought to be in terms of its finances. But I'm suggesting that perhaps consideration may be given. A study certainly should be done to see if some form of levy would not help us to reach better the goals, the financial goals that we have, while alleviating some of the pain upon commuters especially poor community, commuters in urban St. Michael Central or rural St. John. And I think in the same way that we can apply across the board a garbage and sewage tax and that people are asked to pay this, especially poor people who are not linked into the sewage system, perhaps those who are more well-to-do and who travel by costly vehicles could be asked simply to set aside a little bit in a transport levy to help out the cause of the poorer lot among us. After all, we are all in this together. We are all in this together. I want to repeat the call. I made this before, and I've heard in recent weeks of the Honorable Prime Minister making the same call that we incorporate the presence of the public service operators at all levels in helping with transportation of the public in this time of COVID. We do not know how long it will last. Many of these people have been displaced because of the collapse of the tourism sector upon which their livelihoods depended, whether they're at the airport or at the seaport or around the various parts of Bridgetown or elsewhere. I believe, and I, and I, I overhear, the Honorable Minister suggesting is already done. And if it's already done, I applaud that. But I call for it, and I've heard the Prime Minister in recent days or weeks talking about it. Support the call. However, with this qualification, Mr. Speaker, I do not think that when we make such a call, it should be the intention that we seek to offer some kind of favor to any select group. So that select interest that benefited from private contractual arrangements with Ross University contractual arrangements which now lay dormant because of the absence of the university should not be an indication that that is the preferred group. Our friends or allies or our supporters or even our constituents, if that applies, should not be the ones that we single out for benefit in such an exercise. I say that simply from this side to offer the view that this is a good move, a good thing 
if we can properly structure it, but that the initiative should not be pursued from a perspective of offering help simply to our friends or those who support us or those we know well. Now there's some cost hardships that apply in the sector among the private sector operators. Rather than allow for concessions as has been asked for quite some time of both administrations, there was increased imposition with respect to the fuel tax that put a lot of these operators in a spin. And I have heard it described as you know, nickels and dimes. That is certainly not the language I would have expected. When you put this kind of increase with respect to public sector operated vehicles in the private, in the, among private interests, you can't say it's nickel and dimes. The price at the pump became rather painful for them especially in a context where some still had to pay half of their road tax, still have to pay their permit fees annually. I raised this matter before. I raise it again because I think it is important. We can't stand and in one breath say that this sector is a partner. We can't stand in one breath and say that they provide an essential and vital role. In fact, they were classified as essential service when other entities were not. You can't stand and say that in one breath and then in the other breath do not facilitate them and allow some of these hardships to stand and to affect their operations. Now I heard the Honorable Minister speak to respect, with respect to the regulatory entity we call the Transport Authority and he made passing reference to the undesirable behavior and conduct exhibited by some who operate in the sector. And it seemed to me that his attention focused squarely and perhaps solely on the drivers of these vehicles. And it seems to me that his emphasis in terms of the robustness that the regulations will bring uh, that relates again to the drivers and conductors if they have those. But Mr. Speaker, there are some things to be considered. There are some entities, agencies, embodiments. We call them owners. And we have to address the obligations, responsibilities of owners as well. Now, if I own a vehicle and I respect... Point of elucidation, Mr. Speaker. Yes, I remember. A point of elucidation. Um, I thought I, I made it clear I can elucidate on my own speech. I know you can. And I, made it, I, I thought I'd made it clear to the Honorable Member. If I didn't, I will go through it again. The regulations so structured when they come. There are some regulations that will relate just to owners, just to owners. And there's some regulations that will relate to driver, driver conductor. So we have recognized that in the past, the drivers took most of the brunt, but sometimes the owners did not. So I'm hearing the honorable member, and just to elucidate, yes, in the regulations that come, there will be a section, three straight rule as well, for owners, permit holders. And I'm glad to hear that, Mr. Speaker, and I apologize. Um, maybe the honorable member didn't make enough noise when he said it. Uh, previously, but I'm hearing him clearly now, and the noise has reached my ears. And I'm glad to hear that we will pay some attention to the owners as well, because they have a responsibility with a license for vehicle on the road and the privilege to have one and some four and five. And I don't know where the number stops and how they got so many. That's another story to be told. But they have a responsibility, being so privileged as they are, to have these vehicles on the road from which they make some money, whatever the arrangements are for the actual day-to-day -day operations and movements, their responsibility and the regulations should speak to them. Now, the, the 
a lot of the undesirable behaviors, I understand it. I believe you, same, same signals reach you. Uh, derives from the fact that these fellas are hustling. It is the competitive um, nature of the business. I, I saw one overtake me recently, Mr. Speaker, and stop diagonally across the road in front of me, in the middle of the road. And I am glad that it was not you in my position there, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> the outcome probably would have been different. Meaning that I would represent one of them, sir? Uh, I what don't would know. Mean I would represent All one I of them, mean sir? to say is that I held, I held my peace and asked for grace for the moment. Continue, I remember, please. No, I try my best to ignore certain things. You know. There are certain things. There are certain things that don't sit well with me, and I don't see them as part of the political. You know, I see them. I see them as character assassination. I do. I do. But I will ask for grace again in this moment, uh, Mr. Speaker, and and push on. And a lot of the hassle derived, a lot of the bad and undesirable conduct derives from the hassle in the environment out there around the activity. These increases of recent times could only have added, I mean, the increased impositions, notwithstanding the increased bus fares, could only have added, added to that culture of hassle out there. And we've got to understand the dynamics operating in the system, try to address them fully and frontally. And we will stand here and commend any effort that is designed to achieve that goal, that we address these matter and this element of the sector, the private operators, owners, drivers, conductors, what have you. We address issues around them through whatever regulations we need to put in force frontally and fully, but also fairly. And that's simply the position I want to represent. And maybe we ought to take out of the mix, the element of hassle, not only by providing for regulations that run counter to that instinct to hassle and misbehave and indulge in an undesirable conduct, but perhaps we need to put into the mix a fair structure for these, not a fair structure, a fee structure for these operators, these drivers, which is regulated. Transport board driver is paid X amount to money. A PSV operator, a ZR driver, a B man, however they are labeled, I say B, I mean the letter B, please. <laughs> yeah, quickly come to that because I saw the quick glance from my friend from St. Michael South. I tell you, our bosoms beat together. And, um, and, and I'm simply saying perhaps it, it could be studied, could be considered that there is a fee, flat fee, that is regulated in terms of how they earn and take this hassle out of the situation. Left as it is, where the more I can pick up, the faster I can turn around, the more I can make, especially in this time of hardship, we are going to have hassle on top of hassle. And we can't simply say two, three strikes, you're out. We'll be doing that repeatedly. We've been doing that repeatedly, and what we will find is that we're recycling the same type of behavioral models all of the time. I simply want to offer this. My humble friend from Grace Church West did not trouble me much, so I'm not going to trouble him. I remember for St. George North. I want to briefly agree with the suggestions that were made today by the Minister of Transport. <laughs> I think that the Minister
has handled the situation, to my mind, correctly and precisely. And it seemed to me that when you look at what has happened over the past 13 years since this act was passed in 2007, bringing in the Transport Authority, in the very first time that we see anything being done to fast track the regulations which would inform and help to move this sector forward. Clearly, it is with the Barbados Labour Party's mode of understanding public transport. From 1955 to, 19, to 2007, we recognized that public transport was essential and that there must be some level of subsidy by government. When in 1955 the Transport Board was privatized, in 2007 when the Transport Authority was established to regulate public transport in Barbados, we were supposed to go to a different stage and today does not permit me to properly address the whole mode of public transport in Barbados. But I just want to say that the, we envisaged in 2007 when the study was conducted, when we brought the legislation here, that indeed the whole question of bus fares and behavior of the streets and so on was, would have come to an end at the time and that would be to some extent minimized. But we were hoping to look at how we could embrace, because we were looking at an economic model, and the then Minister of Consumer Affairs, Honourable Member for St. Michael North, when he brought the Fair Trading Commission into being, that the commission itself would be the entity to help to regulate public fares, so that even though there must be some level of subsidy by government, to protect the most vulnerable, that in order to have the correct or decent fear, because I heard the member for St. Michael West lamenting the fact that bus fears are high. When he compare what it is to other parts of the world, when he compare to what, ha what happens in other jurisdictions, one will see that the level of bus fears here not is not high at all, is not high because um, efficiency and if a person plans their, their work, if a person plans their trips, you can buy a number of tickets per week or per month or so on, and this would help you. But more to the point, the point is that public transport must be properly regulated. The whole n notion of fair trade, and I hope that um, eventually you will get there where these entities can apply both the Barbados Water Authority, put themselves in order, the transport sector. All of these public sector entities by 2008 were supposed to go to the Fair Trading Commission to get proper regulations and to get proper fair set. It should not be arbitrarily set by um, us as politicians, by the board itself, but these are things that we want to put in place. And that's why I, 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 I must say that the government is on the right track here, getting regulation in place and allowing the Transport Authority to do the work that it has to do. There must be regulation and not looking at a case where they must be looking at how we can penalize workers, penalize drivers, owners, because we need to also look at the positive side. They have made a contribution, yes. They will continue to make a contribution but they have to be regulated properly. There have to be fairness in the sector. We have to ensure that persons are able to receive transportation on demand. By 2008, we were on the right track. The last 10 years have seen a decline in everything has to do with public transport, road maintenance, and everything in this country. And that's why we have to now pick up at a government to move this sector forward. And I would want to say that even though, even though we cry that these, that instructor bad behave, they provide beautiful service.
in my mind, efficient to some extent that persons are able to get to the destination back to and for. And that is not a negative, but of course we have to be able to sit with these guys and say these are the norms, the way of behavior, and so on. So we have to look at the politics, how we can encourage the private sector. But um, so that we still have a long way to go. And I would want to encourage the minister to continue to work towards regulating the sector, not necessarily policing it, because I don't want to use the word policing because policing seems to be a bad word these days. I want to be able to see how we can work together to improve this sector. Only this morning someone said to me that they could not get to their destination and they had to um, go back home, work for a one day has been lost. And we want, this, we, we want to stop this. Persons must be able to get to their destination when they want to, whether it is internally or externally, so that the sector, the sector is playing a vital role. And I want us to understand that transportation is vital for the economic survival of a country. We must see it as that. And therefore, all planners must think in we must think that when we are planning the economy, do not only think in terms of how money moves, how money comes, how people work, how they save their money. Also think in terms of how we can get from one destination from St. Philip to St. Michael to Bridgetown at the time we want to get there. Because Staying on the road, at the time we were, we were thinking and by 2007 that an hour on the road, Mr. Speaker, is too long. That's one of the reasons why um, I said that the Barbados Labour Party understand public transportation. In 1985, when Tom Adams um, looked at the ABC Highway, this is what he was looking at. How do we move from one destination to another in quick time? When we look at, in 2007, eight, at the flyovers, we are looking at how will we move persons from one destination to another in quick time. Now, uh, we have seen what the last pandemic has done to our country. We don't have much transportation on the road today. But in normal times, we are still spending too much time on our roads. And we have to look carefully at public transportation. I can only encourage the ministry, I don't want to speak long on this matter, I encourage the planners to revisit all of the documents that are still in the ministry, revisit what is happening in other destinations across the world, and see what planners do to move the sector forward. I could also only encourage the government to look and to encourage, because I would hate to know that um, because of cost, we have to abandon the transport board, or we have to abandon private sector. We, as a government, must understand that we have a duty to subsidize, in some way, public transportation. And I think we need to sit down over the next couple of months or years or whatever to put our heads together to plan the sector just the way we are planning other sectors in, within the economy. Mr. Speaker, I'm obliged to you. Honourable Member for St. Thomas. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I wish to laud the Honourable Minister of Transport for bringing this, this, these two bills for us to be able to give teeth to the Transport Authority. I know that for many years, as a young girl, we relied on the private transport to be able to go to and fro. Our population of children going to schools, especially the crisscrossing that we now see, was not there. Fewer children had secondary education, and therefore there was no need at that time for so many buses and so many other forms of public transportation on the roads. And those few private sector-owned transportation well, buses 
belonging to the, the private sector and the private concessionaires, those buses were extremely reliable. Bus drivers and workers were persons who were responsible, mature, and made sure that we got to and fro from our various, and to and from our various destinations. But I know that government took over, bus fare was so expensive at that time. And I'm referring to many years ago when I was a young girl. I was one of the people really very happy that government had taken over the system because it had good regulation and of course everything else worked out well because there was a high measure of discipline in every aspect of it. I know that the past Barbados Labour Party administration came up with a vision of identifying the novel idea was to come up with an aspect of business that will empower other Barbadians so that families could come together to buy a minibus, a, Z, a ZR, first it was the, the, the B bus, then the ZR, and so on. And I thought it was great. But then I experienced, and all of Barbados has experienced, an element of disorder, a discipline that is not in keeping with the Barbadian culture at all. I believe, sir, that with all the good intentions, things got out of hand. When some people were able to access five and six and eight permits in one person's name or in a family's name or in a, a group's or company's name, and uh, the transport authority did not have the necessary regulations in place or the teeth to be able to treat to the matter, and then treating it to this, sir, in a very impassioned way, because what I see happening on our roads and now infiltrating our general rural communities is really not in keeping with the culture that Barbadians have grown accustomed to. And it is extremely dangerous and creating numerous problems for everybody, every sphere of a route, don't care where in Barbados it is now. Our senior citizens cannot deal with it, I must contend. And when our young people see it, they too, are getting involved in the level of indiscipline that is contrary to Barbados and the life and the lifestyles that we have lived. And so I am happy to see that some element of strengthening and some teeth and authority is being given to the transport authority to be able to tackle this matter if it is not treated to sir as urgently as possible, it is going to become worse. So regulation for me at this stage and for the Labour Party is critical in order for us to bring the sector and an element of discipline into our system so that people can feel safe on the roads, whether they are using the private transport system or not. I have used it in between. I still try because there are times when you have to take your vehicle somewhere and you need to get to where you're going. But I'm extremely selective because I have got elements of fear in me every day as to what I see on our roads. I want to say, sir, that the system is in a mess, meaning the PSV system. And I heard some of the discussion on a program on Sunday night that even gave me more opportunities to speak with a little more element of authority in this respect. The law needs to be practiced. It needs to have, the, the system needs to have more teeth to be able to bring those perpetrators out of the system and let us go forward with a better, smoother, and more efficient transportation system. There are other countries in the Caribbean who have gone this route and the systems are running exceptionally well. The bad behavior, the loud music, the threats, the fights, the videos that we see, the cursing, it is contaminating our schools children. And unfortunately, there are some parishes, some communities where there is no transport board bus route as such. And because of our limited bus system now, some communities have no transport system at all when it comes to the transport board that a lot of more mature people would rather travel on. But I see our school children every day, and I'm gonna focus, Mr. Speaker, sir, in my small um, intervention, as to what I see on the Jackson route that really needs to be attended to as a matter of urgency. Our school children are putting, sometimes you can see 25 and 30 children packed in those buses. You see the drivers smoking the weed 
drinking the alcohol, cursing everybody, blocking the road. All of our members in here, sir, I believe, are exposed to that kind of behavior wherever they are going in this country. And it is an element that bothers me tremendously because sometimes we see some very serious accidents. People are injured and sometimes the bus is a bus that is off route. And the Honorable Minister, I have, I have given up now treating to the Transport Authority because I would have been seen as a pest, but I don't, don't mind because I'm going to stand up for what is correct and proper. I come in here and make my little jokes and so, but I can get very, very serious on matters where the indiscipline is so rife that people have to jump out of the road, skip out of the road in order to save their lives. They snake on the road. And that Warren's Junction is going to cause quite a few people to be seriously injured or lose their lives because outside of the Warren's Polyclinic, mm -hmm. the now Eunice Gibson Polyclinic, the buses stop there for inordinate periods of time. So anything entering into the community that is to the east of the same bus stop between the, 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 the polyclinic and the same bus stop to take you into Bridgetown, they cannot get out from their homes. There are clinics in there beyond the polyclinic where people have to go to get their various blood tests and so on. And it is one of the most dangerous things and they do not respect pedestrian crossings. I don't know what form of education has to be put in place for people to know a pedestrian crossing is for people who are crossing the street and therefore they should be able to do it freely. But when buses, especially the ZRs and the B buses, are stopping on the crossing at Warren's and soliciting passengers, it is wrong. And I, I, cannot, I cannot say it in any, any other form but to tell everybody in Barbados how angry and upset I am. I have a problem, Mr. Speaker, sir, with the speeding and the accidents. And yes, attorneys at law will get jobs. There's nothing wrong with that. That is their training. That is their responsibilities. But why must the Queen Elizabeth Hospital and other institutions be saddled with people with critical injury and then the services that the taxpayers are paying for. Sometimes we go and you wait to the casualty for hours because of an accident of that nature. It is wrong and we need to have it corrected. So I am in all support of this particular uh, validation with, for the Transport Authority. I believe that we need to put more of those officers who had the responsibility, I don't remember what you call them, but they wear cream top and a brown pants or shirt. Whenever they are at the Warren's Junction, inspectors, when they are at the Warren's Junction, you see elements of order. Why as black people or a cultured people that we are supposed to be, must we have a police officer or some authority in that way for us to do what is right when we are impacting on the lives of everybody? There are people who lose their employment when they have to sit in those buses wherever they are in Barbados to wait. Or when they see a transport board come in, then to scratch off and move off and stop in front of it. All of us know. And I believe it is something that needs to be brought to the fore. I spoke about the ZR and the, B B B the PSBs. Let me say, don't let me just identify them. Once in Parliament, and by the time I got going through Jackson, I was cursed beyond my burial ground. Ground. I am not afraid because anybody who knows me and anybody who should stand up for what is correct and proper and what is for righteousness will speak out against it because it's only a matter of time. We see it every day. A little girl lost her hand in the, the above bus stand, we call it. The Fairchild Street bus stand. Or the, 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 the river bus stand, we call it. Caught, lost, got her hand cut off because of foolishness again. Mr. Mr. Speaker, sir, I am really, very, very upset. And I just want to say that the court system, and I'm thankful for the Honorable Attorney General and the efforts this government is doing for putting other judges and magistrates and so and systems in place for the fast tracking of those hundreds of cases. No ZR man or minibus driver should be going to court with a hundred cases. A hundred reports. What is happening in this place? And then we want to know how the youths get so. The youths get so because those persons who are adults that should be treating to matters of this nature 
are just overlooking it or they're telling to the owners, meaning the bus owners, and the bus owners are people in authority or were in authority that are high society people who are not treating to the matter. And finally, I agree that the workers in the system should be given a flat salary instead of having to hustle to be able to raise extra money to give them good money to carry home. Nearly every last one of them, Mr. Speaker, man or woman have got children of their own. And therefore, they need to be able to get enough of a salary or wage to take home to feed their family instead of having to be all over the place hustling to make an extra dollar bill. Whatever the, the, the owner says, bring home, if the owner says bring home $500 by the end of the day, they have to rush to bring home the $500. I believe that's what causes them to be moving all the time in the reckless way they're doing it. And it seems as though the authority have no teeth. I have refrained from sending information to the authority. I've taken videos. I've taken conversations. I've written official letters. I've sent the numbers of the vehicles because it is wrong. And I'm seeing more and more on a daily basis many buses and ZRs that should not be on the route where I live for the four or five that have been given permission. Sometimes you see as many as 10 of them that are plying the route, driving recklessly, picking up passengers, setting them down, not conforming to the COVID pro um, um, protocols, doing as they like, and people seem to think this fun. The other thing is, they are not going the extent of the routes that they have been given permits to travel. And so many of them will take the form of Lion Castle because they have to come to St. Thomas. The people voted for me resoundingly to represent their interests. And I am sad to know that the people in Lion Castle who have to walk for nearly two miles after they exit the bus by the post office in St. Thomas have to go through the rain, the hot sun, if they are ill, if they are pregnant, if they are disabled, to walk from a main road when the route says any bus going to Sturges must go to Lion Castle, come through Highland, come through Welch Mahal Main Road, go through First Avenue, come through Second Avenue, go through Bryans and Loop, come through to Welch Mahal Main Road, on to Harrison's Cave, go to Sturges, through the Vault Road, come back to town. It is not happening, sir. And I am hurting and I'm expressing it here because it is pointless me now working with the Transport Authority on these matters that are so critical when unfortunately I sent a, a, a video and the person was given a notice from the Transport Authority to be suspended January 2020 for the entire month. That bus worked every day of January 2020, it was never pulled from the road. I believe because this validation bill was not in place. I shall continue to look out for the interests not only of St. Thomas people, Barbados in general, to be able to make sure that people conform with the laws. And I agree with what the Honorable Member and Minister said, the member, Honorable Member for Christchurch, they said about withdrawing the strikes that they should have and if they make the three strikes and they take away the license, take away the PIB permit, whatever. Mr. Speaker, there are some of them that are driving around with fake ZR numbers and possibly B ones. So I haven't seen the Bs. I saw the ZRs. And one of them that I made a report on when it was called in, I was found to be so. So it means that I was not lying. My photographs were not wrong. And you can tell when they have on fake ones. You can see the frame, the bigger frame of what would have been on the ZR before and another one is over it. We must get serious in this country to protect and save people's lives, to let them get to their work on time, to take them to their various destinations and to stop breaching laws or rules or regulations. It is not happening and I am so happy that I am at the age I am at because I don't have to tolerate it at some point in time once the Lord spares my life. I believe, Mr. Speaker, as I close, that the transport board has to be an integral part of a public service for people. And protecting, and the honorable member for St. Michael West made the point, 
for to protecting the most vulnerable. There are some people who have not got the necessary resources, don't care how we try to improve their quality of life. They do not have the resources. And so the senior citizens must be protected. Those who are from the special needs category have to be protected. And the service has to be made available for them. I do not know of any country in the world that has not got a public transport system where the agent, the state, provides provision for them to travel to and fro. I close, Mr. Speaker, the indiscipline when it comes to going off route, when it comes to running through red lights, some civilians, some other people in the Barbados do it as well, private drivers. When it comes to that uniform, when it comes to the drinking and driving, driving a, a bus and using a cellular phone in the air, all of that is still going on and it is escalating as the days go by. I agree, I strongly support this, uh, uh, these two bills for the Transport, Authority, the Transport Authority Validation Bill and I ask that whenever that happens that the infractions that take place are dealt with speedily to save lives, to give people a measure of hope, to take out some of the fear and for the examples that will be set for our young drivers or our young children that they know once I'm living in a society, I have got to conform with rules and regulations if we are to be the disciplined, productive societies that we should be. And therefore, Mr. Speaker, it is with those comments that I would wish to highly commend the bill and to let us go forward and move our tra transportation system out of the gutter because we are not accustomed to it and it is creating too many challenges and causing families to suffer with death, to suffer with serious injury, for the insurance companies to be paying out large amounts of unnecessary funds and for the creation of chaos in some aspects and communities in our country that we can do well without. I wish to thank you, sir, for giving me the time I create. Thank you. Honourable Member, I can, I can see that you spoke with a degree of passion. I just want to remind you that in the adjudicative process, in the adjudicative process, there is something known as the due process of the law. So while I appreciate the passion that you spoke with and that there might be infractions, there is something known that you subscribe to the rule of law in relation to due process of the law. Just like we might. I remember my chair's rest. Thank you very much, um, Mr. Speaker. Um, first, let me thank um, all members who spoke. Um, in the past, I would say on this side and on that side, but there's only one on that side. But um, still, I want to. Well, the question is, we're all in this together. <laughs> but let me thank all, all members who spoke. And uh, first, let me um, reassure the Honorable Member for St. Michael West that yes, in fact, um, I cannot. Um, I cannot even suggest that I will be able to look into the future and see what the will of cabinet will be. But I can tell you that we are very far in discussions into what we call the mass transit authority. And um, that is going to be getting, coming to cabinet very shortly. And then once we get agreement, that will be coming to the parliament of Barbados to be able to bring a better structure to transport uh, within the country. Uh, respect to the subsidy that you asked about, I in fact, if you were to look at the estimates of this year, you would in fact see that the transport sector got a $31 million subsidy last year, and the approved estimates were for a $15 million subsidy this year. So subsidies are a definite part of the transport sector, and um, that will be something that we're looking at because obviously it is a cost that everybody has to carry out of their tax dollars and it's something that we are looking at. With respect to the owner's question that I got up on a point of elucidation, in fact, if you had had a cursory look at the bill itself, 
I, I don't mean to be disparaging, but um, at the actual bill itself, when you look at it as presented to Parliament, in fact does say what the subsequent convictions would be relative not only to the licensed driver or conductor, but 23A, the authority may suspend the permit of an owner as well, owner or operator of a vehicle. So we, we recognized that for a long time, the brunt of the infractions were carried by the driver, but there were some infractions that related to the owner and the regulations will capture the owners as separate. With respect to people being off route that the member for St. Thomas spoke about, we recognize that this is a problem not only for you in St. Thomas, but the member for Christchurch East suffers tremendously by this, going, people going into Time Bottom and Parish Land and so on. He's suffered, I'm not seeing him here, um, but he suffers tremendously, must be, uh, anyway, suffers tremendously by people cutting the route short. I recognize this is a significant problem, people being off route, people trying to go through side roads to get to beat the traffic and all sorts of things. So we have required a, Jeep, uh, a global positioning system mechanism to be placed on all vehicles going forward, and that will be part of the regulation. And you, can, you must be required to carry a GPS system as part of your, of your regulations. The Honourable Member also spoke about um, whether we had only chosen certain people to join the TAP program during the COVID period. And I first want to uh, enlighten our member that we, uh, we had asked anybody, and we met with all of the BT people uh, in the past. I met with all of the ZM people. I met with people who, the church people, actually who had tour buses in the past to ask them if they wanted to come in and provide transport to the sector. That was before COVID. And since COVID, all of those applications and all of those opportunities for people to come in to the program were still open. And we had seven um, BT people, those are tour bus people, who have actually come in and are providing service to the program, and 25 uh, ZM people. So they have, in fact, started uh, to provide uh, the service. They were trained by the transport board. Uh, I met someone recently who told me that he saw quite a few of them in the St. Joseph area. And these were new, these are the BT people who are actually providing the service to assist with the transport board. This is because we recognize that when the 60% restriction was put in place, there were a lot of people that would not be able to access transport so we brought on these people to help to provide that transport. Uh, whether that, will, that, that practice will continue, we will assess and see what is required because we want to get everybody to and fro and transported. You'd also have seen in the, in the press um, that we've also looked for an RFP for somebody to provide a school bus service. So in addition, by providing a separate school bus service, and that RFP actually saw uh, last night actually, uh, to provide a school bus service which would take the school bus service uh, out of the transport board realm and put it for an independent person providing it in collaboration with the transport board. And then that would mean that other buses that normally use the, are providing the school bus service would be available for the routes. So we're trying all sorts of things to provide a good, safe, effective, and reliable transport for all of the people of Barbados. So with those very few words, uh, Mr. Speaker, I would ask that this bill, I'll, I'll do them one at a time, uh, Transport Authority Validation Bill be read a second time. The question is that the aforementioned bill be read a second time. All those honorable members in favor, please say aye. aye. Those against, please say no. We take the ayes out. Thank you, and I would ask that the fears and tools, where is it? Hmm. Where's the other one? Our member has to go to committee. What? Oh, yeah, to go to committee and then come yeah. back. Fine. I'll ask then, Mr. Speaker, that you do leave the chair for further consideration of this bill in committee. The question is that the Speaker do not leave the chair and the House resolve itself into committee for further consideration of this bill. All those honorable members in favor, please say aye. aye. Those against, please say no. We think the yes up. This house is now in committee. Clause one. Oh. The chairman beg to move that clause one stand part. Question is that clause one stand part. All members in favor, please say aye. 
All those, somebody said. Yeah, all those against it in there, me thinks the eyes have it. Clause two. Madam Chair, I beg to move that clause two stand part. Question is that clause two stand part. All honorable members in favor, please say aye. Aye. All honorable members against, please say nay. Me thinks the eyes have it. The schedule. Madam Chair, I beg the schedule be the schedule to the bill. Question is that the schedule be the schedule to the bill. All honorable members in favor, please say aye. All honorable members against, please say nay. Me thinks the eyes have it. Report. Madam Chair, I beg that you do not report to this honorable speaker the passage of one bill in committee. Question is that I do not report to this honorable speaker the passing of one bill in committee. All honorable members in favor, please say aye. All those against, please say nay. Methinks the ayes have it. Chairman of committees has reported the passing of one bill in committee. The speaker, I do beg that this bill be now read a third time. The question is that the aforementioned bill be read a third time. All those honorable members in favor, please say aye. Aye. Those against, please say no. We think the ayes have it. The speaker, I beg to move that this bill be do now passed and cited as the Transport Authority Validation Bill 2020. No, no, no. Miscellaneous provisions. Huh? Okay. That, that public transport miscellaneous provisions act. Oh, public transport miscellaneous provisions act. That's the first one that you did. 2020. Yeah. Sorry, Miss. Public transport miscellaneous provisions act. 2020. The question is that the affirmation bill be passed and so cited. All those honorable members in favor, please say aye. aye. Those against, please say no. We think the ayes have it. This bill is passed and so cited. Order number 12, sir. In the name of the Honorable Minister of Transport, Works and Maintenance, to move the second reading of the Transport Authority Validation Bill 2020. It's the next one. Honorable Christ Church West. Mr. Speaker, I beg to move that this bill be read a second time. The question is that the aforementioned bill be read a second time. All those honorable members in favor, please say aye. Those against, please say no. Me think the ayes have it. Mr. Speaker, I beg that you do, do now leave the chair and the House resolve itself into committee for further consideration of this bill. The question is that the Speaker do now leave the chair and the House resolve itself into committee for further consideration of this bill. All those honorable members in favor, please say aye. Those against, please say no. Me think the ayes have it. Clause 1. Madam Chair, I beg to move that Clause 1 stand part. Question is that Clause 1 stand part. All honorable members in favor, please say aye. aye. All those against, please say nay. Me thinks the ayes have it. Clause 2. Madam Chair, I beg to move that Clause 2 stand part. Question is that Clause 2 stand part. All, all honorable members in favor, please say aye. All those against, please say nay. Me thinks the ayes have it. Report. Madam Chair, I beg to move that you do not report to this honorable speaker one passage of one bill in, one passing of one bill in committee. <laughs> the question passing. is that I, that I do not report to this honorable speaker the passing of one bill in committee. All honorable members in favor, please say aye. All those against, please say nay. Me thinks the ayes have it. Chairman of committees has reported the passing of one bill in committee. Mr. Speaker, I beg to move that this bill be now read a third time. The question is that the aforementioned bill be read a third time. All those honorable members in favor, please say aye. Those against, please say no. We think the ayes have it. Mr. Speaker, I beg to move that this bill be now passed and cited as the Transport Authority Validation Bill 2020. Rent per act, sorry, 2020. The question is that the aforementioned, bit, aforementioned act be now passed and so cited. All those honorable members in favor, please say aye. 
those against, please say no, me think the yes have it. This act is passed and so cited. Order number 14, sir. In the name of the Honorable Minister in the Ministry of Finance and Economic Affairs, to move the passing of a resolution to approve on the Section 3 of the Special Loans Act, Chapter 105, the borrowing by the government of the sum of Barbados $2,493,271 from Scotia Bank Barbados Limited to repair an existing overdraft facility held by the Caribbean Broadcasting Corporation. I remember Christchurch East Central. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. As you are aware, sir, um, upon coming to office, the government announced a comprehensive domestic and as well as external debt restructuring, of which the central government took responsibility for a number of debts and monies owed or owing by a number of state-owned enterprises. And therefore, the resolution before the chamber this, this afternoon, um, sir, is one of the aspects related to the, in this instance, the overdraft facility of the Caribbean Broadcasting Corporation. Uh, permit me, sir, just to read the resolution for the record of the chamber before I get into the particular substance of the matter. So, the resolution reads, sir, whereas by virtue of Section 2 of the Special Loans Act, Cap 105, the government is authorized from time to time to borrow from another government, any bank, corporation, company, or other institution, sums of money not exceeding in the aggregate Barbados 2 million Sorry, Barbados two billion five hundred million dollars on such terms as may be agreed upon between the government and the lender of any such sum of money. And whereas by section three of the said act it is provided that any money borrowed under the authority of this act shall be appropriated and applied to such purposes as Parliament may approve by resolution and that such money and any interest payable thereon is charged upon the general revenues and assets of Barbados. And whereas the government considers it necessary to borrow the sum of Barbados $2,493,271 from Scotiabank Barbados Limited to repay an existing overdraft facility held by the Caribbean Broadcasting Corporation. And whereas the said sum of Barbados $2,493,271 is borrowed on the terms and conditions contained in the commitment letter, the main provisions of which are set out in the schedule. And whereas the said sum of Barbados $2,493,271 is within the authorized borrowing limit given to the government under Section 2 of the said Act. Be it resolved that Parliament, that, sorry, be it resolved therefore that Parliament approve the borrowing of the said sum of Barbados $2,493,271 from Scotia Bank Barbados Limited to repair an existing overdraft facility head, held by the Caribbean Broadcasting Corporation on the terms and conditions contained in the commitment letter and the main provisions of which are set out in the schedule. Mr. Speaker, sir, as the government came to office, sir, in 2018 and immediately embarked on the comprehensive debt restructuring of both the domestic and foreign commercial, external commercial debt. And the government assumed the responsibility centrally on behalf of a number of state-owned enterprises, approximately some $718 million in loans held by state-owned enterprises, which were exchanged as part of the, the new um, government of Barbados um, securities. Now, in accordance, sir, with the terms negotiated um, 
overdraft facilities were excluded in the domestic debt exchange. And so therefore, we felt it was important that we, in order to assist some of the, the state enterprises, which had to, notwithstanding the us, the central government, assuming the responsibility for the debt, that structurally they needed to go through a number of reforms, which as you know, sir, under the Barbados Economic Recovery and Transformation Program, a number of state-owned enterprises of which the Caribbean Broadcasting Corporation is a part, have gone through a, no, a, a series of, of reforms to be able to put these institutions, sir, on a much more financially viable path, but certainly being able to improve the quality of services that they're offering to the public. Now, sir, um, so we, we propose then that the overdraft facilities be closed and converted to new, learn, to new loans, which obviously will be serviced by the government. So in this context, sir, uh, we sought to address the, the overdraft facility held by the CBC, Caribbean Broadcasting Corporation, sir, with Scotiabank. Um, the truth is, sir, that this facility is meant to be paid over the course of 18 months and, it, and the term sheet, sir, which is in the schedule. Um, the amount, as previously said, sir, um, before is $2,493,271 and it will be paid over the course of 18 months, which is the term of, of, of the loan. The loan share shall be paid in 18 monthly blended principal and interest payments of Barbados $144,062.08 each month, sir. And the balance of the loan together with all accrued interest and amounts outstanding shall be paid on or before the date, which is 18 months from the date of the initial advance. The interest rate, sir, on this particular facility we negotiated is actually 5%. Um, and interest is payable monthly and calculated on the basis of the calendar year, sir, for the actual number of days um, elapsed divided by 365. Now, sir, the reality of the situation is that when we came to office, sir, and just to give a little bit of history, um, the facility that has been renegotiated, sir, um, was standing at in the interest on the overdraft was around 10%, sir, 10%. And just to give a little bit of history on this particular facility, um, the, uh, this specific account, sir, was opened in August of 1972 at clearly the Bank of Nova Scotia. And the overdraft facility then in 2006, sir, was increased from $1 million to $3 million, which seem natural sir in response to the growing um the growth of the business and then in 2009 sir the overdraft facility then was increased again by two million to five million dollars to fund obviously anticipated increase in in business um the reality sir is as you know the caribbean broadcasting corporation sir has been operating uh Over, the, over its inception, sir, primarily by being able to um, source material from outside, sir. And as you know, sir, um, based on intellectual property, you have, you, you have to, per, you have to um, pay the appropriate royalties with respect to that. In order to provide content, certainly, to um, the Barbadian public. Um, as we would have seen over the years, sir, there's been an expansion um, in terms of where the MCTV component would have uh, moved from STV to MCTV. Um, and whilst Barbados would have subscribed to that initially, the liberalization for, for the most part of that market space um, would have seen new entrance into that space. Over certainly the last 10 years, sir, TV on demand has become a much more uh, prevalent um, option for Barbados as our Barbados then increase the access to internet and therefore I can watch TV whenever I want sir as opposed to waiting um, for the Sunday matinee as we, when we were a little boy sir um, on Sunday afternoon 
to, to so do. And therefore, the cooperation, sir, has not always kept pace with what has been happening from a technological perspective. And certainly, sir, in the media business, one has to be particularly aggressive and agile in, a, in an environment where it is driven to, to by competition, one, and by being able to produce content which then can be um, priced accordingly for the appropriate um, distribution to the market. Now, sir, um, I don't know a lot about media. Um, I don't know a lot about, about, about production. But we all know, sir, that a majority of what the Caribbean Broadcasting Corporation um, does in the context of what the public sees, we know that they have a number of radio stations. We know that they also have the NCTV component, and we also know that they have Channel 8, sir, as its primary um, um, lines of business. And the truth is, sir, there is a private entity that when one compares um, to CBC, notwithstanding the full backing of government over the years, there is a private entity that, pro that does similar things with the exception of producing for TV8, Channel 8. I, and I remember, sir, as a boy um, watching Channel 3 before it went to Channel 9, before it then became 8. And the reality is, sir, that was one can, could understand why you would move from one platform to another, the reality is that we've seen in the space other competitors, sir, deliver similar services to the public competitively, which then obviously um, would have potentially, sir, um, taken market share away from what CBC would have been able to, to garner, given that when I was a when I was a little boy, sir, the only thing to watch was either CBC, sir, or some tapes from the video shop. And the reality is that that too has changed because as we know, sir, nobody writes tapes anymore for the most part. And I think that in the last, certainly in the last 15 years, nobody has really rented tapes in the way that we used to write tapes, sir, um, when, we, when we were growing up. And these are some of the, the things that the public understands happens, obviously, in an environment where once you started to move from, first it was cassette tape, sir, and you stick it in your radio, and you would dub off um, a few um, tunes or whatever you want to do off of the, the, the radio. Then VCRs came into the mixer, and therefore persons had access, which will then go to the video shops to be able to watch content other than what perhaps CBC was offering, sir. Then came DVD, sir, which allowed for much greater level of storage. And then, as I said, sir, in the last 15 to 20 years, with the increase of internet penetration and access to global TV, and you know, sir, we have Netflix, you have Amazon, you have Hulu, you have a whole slew, sir, of options available now that we did not have when we were growing up, sir. And CBC, sir, has not necessarily um, changed its structure to respond to what has been a very aggressive um, form of competition, not just domestically, as I said, with the other entities and players who have come into the market and have not only been competing directly with the lines of business, with the exception of just the free to, the free to air, I just say free to air in a very loose in a very loose sense, sir, because it's not free. <laughs> um, but free to air is the only space in Barbados that CBC operates, but it comes at a cost. But all of the other lines of business, sir, um, there's strict competition. But not just that there's strict competition in that space, but other entities are also offering additional services on top of that. So therefore, when you put all of that in the mixer, and no significant investment to upgrade technologies over the years, was 
we would have been spending money at CBC. We weren't necessarily spending money over the years in terms of improving the underlying IT infrastructure that CBC was operating under. And therefore, what, we've, what we have found is that CBC, while still providing a credible service to the public, it is doing so, sir, at a cost that really and truly should be done at a fraction of what is being done if investments were made with respect to being able to upgrade the underlying technology. And the truth is, sir, that notwithstanding, um, and let me just say, just for the benefit of, of those who are, who are keenly listening, the government is still committed to ensuring that there is a f access to news and information, um, and certainly in the 21st century, it is critical. It is even more critical now, sir, in the midst of this pandemic, as you would realize, that people have access to information. And therefore, the government is still committed to ensuring that people get access to credible information that they can trust, especially, sir, in an environment where we're operating, where there's access to all kinds of things, sir, that the slightest thing can be distorted and within a, a, a nanosecond on social media. There's nothing that you can put on any channel that can potentially pull back what has already gotten out there um, um, so quickly. And therefore, whilst the, all of the media um, in Barbados now operate in this social media environment, because they have to, that's number one. And they do know that um, CBC has capacity in that space. But they're always still, sir, um, the traditional avenues that once delivered appropriately, sir, and once properly funded and staffed, that we can see a better use, perhaps, of the resources to be able to move forward. And so this the restructuring of this particular overall um, this overdraft facility for the Caribbean Corporation, um, Broadcasting Corporation, as I said, was part of the restructuring. So CBC, um, and just for the record, sir, um, I'm, I'm trying to find the, 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 the number. When um, the government came to, off, to office, as you know, sir, there were headlines prior to us coming to office, sir, saying that the, the, the Caribbean Broadcasting Corporation was in debt of over $100 million. Um, which nobody really could understand, sir, how, how that was even <laughs> possible um, for an institution um, of that nature to have been able to, to um, be allowed over time to increase a stock of debt that clearly became unsustainable because as you would appreciate, sir, for an, a, an institution where notwithstanding the performance of NCTV, which really was the operations with respect that provided the cash to CBC, that even though MCTV was the underlying um, business line, that allowed for CBC to run on a day-to-day -day basis because of the subscription, that so long as you had such competition in the market, sir, with the other entrants, and, they have, and the competition has been stiff because, as I said, sir, they, they've added, they've added um, services beyond that which CBC offers. And therefore, with that view, it would have been clear that CBC could not have been able to sustain itself in the current structure sorry, its previous structure and composition, given where the cash flows were, were going. Now, sir, part of that debt um, relates to the pension fund, and I won't, I won't get into that specific element today, um, because notwithstanding all that was happening over the years, the pension fund as it relates to CBC was not, having been established, was not appropriately funded. Um, funded. That's number one. Um, the corporation was running deficits, um, huge deficits um, for a significant amount of time to the point where at one stage the corporation was running in the vicinity of 
15, 16 million dollars a year, sir, deficit in the last few years, which is inconceivable, sir, with respect to good order and good management of any um, institution. And therefore, when we came to office as part of the Burke Plan, sir, we undertook a series of reforms at the corporation. And was the, the I, I can say to, this ch to the chamber, the reforms did not necessarily go as far as we would like because the, the, the operational deficit at CBC today is just over um, half a million dollars a month, which is still um, too high with respect to where everything else is. And as you know, sir, um, there will be further um, reforms to be undertaken at, at the CBC because CBC now has to come fully, sir, into the 21st century in order to right size itself in terms of being able to be self-sufficient. The truth is, sir, that the, the, there are elements in the country from a production perspective, sir, that whatever form or structure CBC may have going forward will have to be able, capable of accommodating, sir, the content in part, the content that is being produced in the country as an outlet with respect to being able to, 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 do, to, to reach, not just people in Barbados, sir, but certainly on satellite TV and a whole host of other, other outlets that potentially CBC can play a role with respect to unleashing a lot of the talent that is in Barbados. And therefore, that's something that I would love to see coming out of um, the, the, any proposed restructuring of the CBC to change the underlying mechanism through which they, they supply services um, to the public. And so we, sir, have, um, so let me just state, sir, um, for the absolute clarity, <laughs> and these are CBC's um, statistics. Um, the cumulative deficit, annual deficit, sir, went from um, 73 um, million in 2008, sir, to 100 and to 100 million 517,606 by 2017. Now, under the program, the Barbados Economic Recovery and, and Transformation Program, sir, we, the government, not CBC, notwithstanding, across a number of state agencies, sir, the government engaged in an exercise where a number of obligations were written off across agencies. So you had a situation where some of the state agencies would have owed CBC, so CBC might have owed somebody else, um, Water Authority, for example, or, or owed SSA, or a whole host of interagency um, balances. So when we came to office with respect to the debt restructuring, we looked at what, which government departments owed other the government departments money, sir, and we simply wrote those off to ensure that we understood exactly what was owed. Because if I owe you and you owe me and, and, and everything is in the same pot, essentially, sir, it really doesn't make sense all of us carrying this headache about trying to collect, I trying to collect from you, sir, and you trying to collect from me, so therefore we, we settled that. So that we understood exactly, for not just in the instance of CBC, but for all of the other government agencies, once we cleared what government owed itself, essentially, then we had a better understanding as to what, in effect, was owed um, out there. And so, um, at the end then, sir, of fiscal year 2019, when we did all of that, sir, um, with respect to, to where we were, it meant that um, the debt for CBC then was of just above $41 million. So after we cleaned out all of the interagency stuff, um, that was what was left with respect to um, CBC. So the resolution here, sir, um, today, was it speaks to the overdraft facility, we had to deal, sir, with that big stock of debt, which has been, as you know, 
based on the domestic debt restructuring, the debt validation bill that came, the debt holder bill that came in 2018, sir, those will be rolled into one of the instruments with respect to what was issued as new debt. And in a sense, all of these state owned enterprises now have a clean slate with respect to debt, except that obviously government has taken the responsibility. I haven't taken the responsibility, sir, because and you know, sir, that we passed the Public Finance Management Bill, and people always would like to say that they are autonomous. But as you know, sir, if you're, as my grandmother would tell me that it can't be a man or a woman living here. So if you want autonomy, sir, it means that you've got to be able to pay your own bills. And therefore, having taken over, sir, and a series of, of obligations on behalf of state-owned enterprises, it, that naturally meant, sir, that transfers that would happen on a normal basis um, wouldn't happen because you, you need discipline, sir, in order to be able to move forward. So um, we, sir, have sought to put from a financial perspective the best solution in place with respect to the structure of CBC financially as, as, as it stands. But now the next phase, sir, is for, for the other reforms now to take place to ensure that the operations now of CBC can move forward with respect to being able to operate truly in the 21st century with 21st century tools in order to be able to compete with all of the other entities out there who are investing in the 21st century. And therefore, I believe, sir, that over the course of the next few months, um, certainly the public, um, once everything goes well, with respect to the, the, the results of the, the RFP that has been put out, that through that process, Barbados will be able to see and hear um, what will be the outcome of those deliberations with respect to being able to bring CBC into the 21st century. Now, sir, I must say to you that, and I, I, I couldn't, I can't take my seat without indicating that in res and even though I, I, I said it before, the CBC um, has been, and through its MCTV um, division, which has been the, the, the cash flow for CBC for some time, um, those revenues clearly have been declining because, as I indicated, sir, the competition out there is actually quite very, very, very strong. And certainly with the advent of, on, um, of video on demand, sir, you have YouTube, you have a whole host of services out there that Barbadians can stay in their homes at any time, sir, and watch what they want, when they want for, however, you can pause it, sir, and go to the toilet and come back. You can't do that with, with well, you can do that with live TV, except that CBC doesn't have that digital platform to allow me to pause a program and go and do what you got to do and come back and do it. And therefore, that's the kind of pressure that the corporation is under and they need to respond. Now, that's not the only reason, but certainly, sir, the subscriptions with respect to um, MCTV have been declining um, over the years, and certainly we've seen a significant decline, certainly, over the last five years in terms of the subscriptions to, to MCTV. As a result, as you can imagine, sir, if the subscriptions drop, it means the revenue drops, and when the revenue drops, sir, it means that those operational deficits that I was, I, I was referring to earlier means then that they're under pressure. And therefore, um, it is important that the certainly the, the I think with bringing a new way of doing things in terms of being more efficient and being a little more entrepreneurial, sir, because we can't sit back as a state owned enterprise and just assume that the taxpayers will will cover you without having the the business plan in place to be able to compete in the twenty first century because you, you essentially, sir, are not even on the track. You're not even prepared to, to get on your mark to be able to compete with others. And the truth is that the CBC has to, to go through a process now, sir, where that is done such that better service can be provided. And I believe, sir, that under a new framework that that can be done. And it will take some time. It will take some investment. 
and therefore um, I really do look forward to seeing um, to seeing a new look um, Caribbean Broadcasting Corporation that can actually um, do some wonderful things for exposing a lot of talent um, in Barbados. Um, I I won't go much further into into the details with respect to to CBC, but I know that um, sir, we have uh, an obligation, certainly in a small society, to ensure that persons have access to credible information. And whilst I know that tangentially, sir, the government has access to, um, I think it's 10% of all air time um, out there, the under, uh, was that is was that is so, we are still pretty much at the mercy of 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 persons of determining when they pay when they will play or give access to that ten percent. Um, now we do have a uh, uh, and let's say we know this is government, and I know that the the government information service provides. Uh, a very good service with respect to what it offers to the public, its, its engagements with the, the various media houses and what have you. And therefore, in that, in that vein, sir, we, they have been using them um, with a lot more um, regularity, more of the, the social media component. But as you know, sir, social media is not the only platform that is out there. And we do have to still ensure that we engage a full court press to ensure that we can reach the segments of the community where they are, because not everybody has a smartphone, nobody has, not everybody has Instagram, not everybody has a Facebook account, which contrary to what people may believe, not everybody has access to all of these things. And therefore, there is still a responsibility for government to ensure that persons can have access to information. So in whatever form or, or, or that, that comes in, I, 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 I am taking it safe to say that I can assure the public that that will still, some element of that will still be in place going forward in order to ensure that persons can have access to information. It is how you may access it, maybe the issue in terms of whatever media, media that is used, but whatever is used, sir, it has to be capable of reaching the widest cross section of persons um, in the country. And so, sir, um, that is the, in essence, sir, the resolution before the chamber, which is to restructure the, overgra the overdraft facility um, for the Caribbean Corporation, Caribbean Broadcasting Corporation with um, Scotia Bank, which in this is part of the domestic, an extension, I should say, of the domestic um, debt restructuring. And I do believe, sir, that this, the restructuring of this would allow for a little ease with respect to CBC in the context of the total monies that were already um, um, rolled into the domestic debt exchange. And therefore, um, this should provide a little more certainty with respect to the financial operations of the entity. And so with those um, few introductory words, sir, um, I'm obliged to you. Honorary Member Mr. Michael West. Thank you very much, um, Mr. Speaker. I must begin by saying that I will not support. I remember for questions essential. Yes. Mr. Speaker, I beg to move that this bill be read the first. The resolution, sorry. The resolution be read the first time. Sorry, sorry. I beg to move that this resolution do not pass. Sorry. Continue on her Thank you, Mr. Speaker. As I was saying, I will not support this resolution before the House for a few simple, but I think very important reasons, some of which 
couple of which are philosophical. But inherently important to how democracy plays out in Barbados. But I will begin on something perhaps which is not so profound. I'm looking at a copy of the Auditor General's report, which suggests to me that auditors were unable to confirm or verify by any alternative references or means. Honorable Member, can, can you make reference to the page? Yes, go on. It's on page. 2018, 2016, It is the Auditor General's report just laid here. Right. So could you read it? The Algeria's report just laid here, and it is at 5-4 five, five on page 91. That's chapter 5 on page 91, section 5.54. Has to do with the Caribbean Broadcasting Corporation. Statement clearly made the corporation was issued a disclaimer of opinion as the auditors were unable to confirm or verify by alternative means, accounts receivable of $2.8 million at the 31st of March, 2019. The resolution is asking of the House that we approve government's borrowing of $2.4 million in the interest of CBC. Statement of these, the statement from the Auditor General's office says, there's a disclaimer of audit opinion with respect to CBC's accounts of on March 31st in the year under that year under review, which reflects no proper accounting for receivables stated to be $2.8 million. That is more than the resolution is asking of us for government to have leave to acquire True Scotia Bank to help, as the Auburn member for Christchurch East Central put it, restructure the debt at, restructure the finances up at CBC, the old draft facility, he put it, up at CBC. I cannot, especially in light of much of that which the Auditor General has said in this report, which we will have plenty of time to look into, support this. Much ado has been made about a $1.45 billion inquiry by the Auditor General's respect to the BWA. And that has to be looked into. It signals very poor practices, and I will make my language no stronger than that at this time, on behalf of the Barbados Water Authority. But I know we can compare or contrast the amounts so and say that we're talking about chalk and cheese. The principle is the same. If we have a state-operated entity that is not properly accounting for its operations, then we have to take pause. And when we're faced with a circumstance that Parliament is being asked by the Minister of State in the Ministry of Finance via this resolution to support this access to funding on loan through Scotia Bank to restructure the over, over, overdraft mechanisms at CBC, then I have to stop and say I will not, I cannot support it unless we can get some clarification. I can go on and I will not take much time on that because it goes on next couple of lines to make reference to another $700,000 for which there's again a disclaimer of opinion and this has to do with accounting for inventory. And the auditors were unable to verify with respect to the inventory count to the value of $700,000. So we're not gonna move forward operating blind not knowing the source of these concerns or the cause for these concerns and vote in approval of this resolution. 
Now, I have to ask because the honorable member for Christchurch Central did not say. He did say that the state operated entities are operating with a clean bill of health, and that, that must be the case. But I don't know that he told us what is the level of indebtedness to overseas program suppliers currently by the CBC. I raised that because I saw it raised in the public arena by interest overseas that Barbados was defaulting on its obligation to pay the necessary liabilities and royalties with respect to programming. That it, was be, that it was using from overseas sources. But I've heard nothing made said with reference to the current level of indebtedness on, on, on the part of the corporation with respect to its overseas creditors who supply programs and other content for its use. The inference could be drawn, and certainly the implication was given that the entity we call CBC was basically pirated. And that's the reputation that we were developing. That's not the charge which I lay. I'm simply suggesting that that is what was put into the public domain by interest overseas. And it would be good, therefore, to know the level of indebtedness with respect to the corporations of the corporation these would be overseas creditors and suppliers of programs and other content. I'd also like to ask, and I don't know if the minister is in a position to state the honorable minister with primary responsibility for this portfolio does not sit in this house. She sits in an honorable seat in the other place. But perhaps someone here holding a brief for that ministry can speak to this. What are the numbers which have been laid off at the corporation in the last two years? Because I happen to know that this administration held a certain view that the corporation was overpopulated in terms of its employment complement. And that even when you compared it to other bigger and larger entities, that still held true. That there were too many people. That's not what I'm saying. That was what the, this administration said. That was his view. That there are too many people employed at CBC. So I'm asking, in the last two years, how many of them have been severed, laid off, cut, reduced, eliminated in terms of their jobs? What have you? And in that regard, uh, with re reference to that, how many persons have been newly contracted at the corporation and for what services have they been contracted and this is the persons like yourself well mr speaker i see you smiling and i'm learning a little bit of the art of raising query and i'm suggesting that we need to hear how many have been laid off since the administration took that view that the employment levels were oversubscribed and how many have been taken on contract in the last two years and for what services now I think those things are important they may constitute nuisance value in the eyes of some but I think Bajans, Barbadians want to know if government is going to continue to borrow to address financial gaps at the CBC, what exactly is going on? I'm not saying that if the operations of the corporation are in such a state all other things being equal and in proper place that the corporation should not be from time to time subsidized by government's assistance but if we have questions if we have queries and everything else does not seem to be properly in place and i'm suggesting that i can't comfortably vote 
in support of this. Now, speaker, let's get a little bit more to the philosophical or ideological. I watched on my TV channel eight part of a program a few Sunday nights ago styled People's Business intended to give a two-year review of this administration's performance. I really felt a little bit of a sense of shame as to the composition of the panel and the focus of the program. I mean, if you are going to review the two-year performance of an, a party in the office of government, you can't bring to the panel exclusively. You can't bring to the panel exclusively three persons who have either served or are serving currently in the cabinet of the same administration. You can't have them attended by a fourth who is known to look with an eye of favor upon the administration, especially in his very senior years. But that is what I saw. I saw in the earlier afternoon a panel discussion among some young people. And there were obviously a number of people there with mixed views and mixed party affiliation, clearly, clearly. But in the night, with a panel more adult, more experienced, reviewing the two-year performance of this administration, I saw four persons, three of whom live in the bosom of this administration, three of whom live still in the bosom of this administration and one who has an affinity for the administration. I thought that that was grossly unfair. And I thought to myself, why not a voice from the Democratic Labour Party? Why not a voice from Solutions Barbados? Why not a voice from the UPP. I didn't have to ask with respect to the PDP. I understood why. But I wondered why not a voice from one of the other three parties. And I thought further to myself, what does this administration, for all of its boasting, for all of its competence, what does this administration have to fear? In this honorable house, Mr. Speaker, the configuration politically, party-wise, is 29 to 1. In terms of debate, Mr. Speaker, it is 28 to 1. In the other place, it is 12 against 9. For debating purposes, I would like to think it is 11 against 9. I'm sure about here. I'm not so sure about any <laughs> other place. So the numbers I go with is 28 to 1 up here. And, 20, and uh, 12 to 9 in the other place. That's 40. That is 40, Mr. Speaker, against... Ten. What does this administration have to fear by allowing for other opinion to be presented? What does this administration have to fear by allowing for its prominent voices to be cross-examined or interrogated by alternate opinion? You tell me. Mr. Speaker, in Barbados in 2020, with Parliament so configured as it is, with the government as popular as it thinks it is, 
and in many people's minds as it actually is, what then is the problem? That you are reviewing and you can only find comfort in having opinion expressed which you know will be in keeping with the message which you are trying to market. I tried to call that program, Mr. Speaker, and nobody answered me. Not a fellow, not a fellow answered when I called. And I called, I called about five, I called about five or six times, and it's a program open to call ins. Yes. And no answer. I resolved next morning that we're making some more calls. Yes. And I called. And I called more than one person. So you can't identify with, I identify what I'm going to say with anybody in particular. And you know what I was told, Mr. Speaker? That was our view too. That that imbalanced perspective which was given was wrong. And you know what I was told? You know, I was told, person who said this, said that they felt a sense of a little bit of shame when they recognized the quality of the earlier youth program when compared to the one in the night. All I'm saying here, Mr. Speaker, I was told, we, fe we, fe we felt, I was told then, we feel the same way you do. We felt that there should be better balance. And we wanted a couple of other persons who would represent an alternative opinion. But it went right up the line. And I will not, I will not, in the interest of decency, say how far up the line I was told that it went. I can't swear that it is true. But I was told that it went up the line, up the line, up the line. And ultimately, the instruction was the panel was to be so comprised as it was. In 2020, in 2020, that is bad. With Parliament configured as it is, with the government carrying the mandate, which it does, that is not only bad, it is wrong. And I said I will address this in formal letter because I want equal time for opposition voices. I can only speak for me, but I said on the phone, I want equal time for opposition. I'll put it in writing, and I did, requesting access on the same subject for the PDP. And I got a response which I would not share here. But needless to say, I see no invitation come. I have seen no furtherance of the matter. But that is the Barbados in which we live. And I say this, and those who sit here in the right minds better consider it. Because the CBC, as a broadcast entity, is being overused by the administration currently to its advantage and to the disadvantage of other opinion in Barbados. And the point I really want to make is that those who sit in this chamber, as a part of this administration, perhaps needs to realize as well that even them, even they, some of them internally are being marginalized from access. There was once a time when I would see on our screens, every night on CBC, four or five or six or seven ministers of government. Nowadays, I don't see that. Some of you are being sidelined. It is not your voice that is being amplified. It is not your image that is being embellished. It is that of others. 
it is that of others. So that CBC is being used as a mouthpiece for marketing and putting out the message of the government. And when I speak to the message of the government, I am really localizing that to the embodiment of one or two people. And some of you are becoming just as excluded as the rest of us. Yes, we all appear there from time to time. But you people are bright people. You went to the best schools and colleges and universities in Barbados. And you know it is not only showing a man's face, his posture. Yeah, use of technical stuff to enhance or deflate or distort images. It is where you position a person. It is where you position a person in the item lines. It is what you allow a person to be heard saying, sometimes the least important. It is when you camouflage and cover the message which is most pertinent. The things that would cause barbarians to stand up and question the quality and performance of the government. There are some in the media fraternity. There are some. Look, 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 don't, don't get me, don't get me stirred. We have now come to a place where in Barbados, the power of the government in control over CBC is such that we are seeing often the news hour eclipsed so that the message of the government, the one it wants marketed, can be seen and heard. We are seeing long speeches and addresses on our screens. And if they are not long enough, they're then repeated and repeated more than once. Now you can sit there in your discomfort and not publicly in any way show visible acknowledgement that this is true, but you're intelligent people and you know it is true. All administrations have complained over time. All political parties have complained over time about the use of CBC and this, the administration of the day and its abuse of power with respect to that entity. But I think we have now reached a stage in Barbados where it is the worst I have ever seen. And you guys know that. I apologize, Mr. Speaker. The honorable members know that. And that's the reality. There's some in the media fraternity who will tell you that political pressure, political pressure is the thing which most influences news output in Barbados. That is documented. And there's some who will tell you that if you speak with them quietly. Then there's the power of the advertising dollar. So business entity A does not like this story. It does not come or it is distorted or it is withdrawn. And if ministers make gaffes, calls can be made to make sure that those gaffes are not carried. I know. Because media people tell you what they have to live through. What am I talking about? You think I'm talking about CBC, Mr. Speaker? I'm talking about democracy. I'm talking about the threats to democracy. I'm talking about the perils and danger on the doorstep of the democratic practice in Barbados. That's what I'm talking about. No, CBC. It is a bigger issue than CBC. CBC is a struggling entity, financially and otherwise, that seeks to play a viable, proper, positive function, but it is subject to political pressures and to the influence of advertising dollars sometimes, not only CBC, the wider media. And I'm so, Mr. Speaker, therefore, talking about democracy in Barbados. 
and the manipulation of the media to serve narrow political ends or the narrow ends of select business interests in Barbados. That is the reality that we live. That is the reality that we face. It is true, and I don't accuse the wider media fraternity of this, but it is true, Mr. Speaker. You know them, and I know them. There are some who are very unprofessional. And you know how the lack of professionalism is made most evident? Not in the bias they bring to what they say or write. It is made most evident when you make reference to their career moves. You with me, Mr. Speaker? The greater evidence is to be seen when you observe where they move from and where they move to and how fast they move. That is the greater evidence. Lack of professionalism. What am I talking about, Mr. Speaker? I'm not talking about a few unprofessional people. I'm talking about democracy and the media's role in preserving democracy. That's what I'm talking about. CBC may be owned, may be operated and managed by the administration. But CBC is owned by the people of Barbados. CBC is owned by the people of Barbados, not by the government of the day. And the manipulative fingers and the power of political pressure and influence wherever and however it is embodied must be checked in the interests of our democracy. That's where we are in 2020. The role of the media is to help us guard against the dangers of unchecked power. Help us to guard against the dangers of a power imbalance in the state. And right now there's a power imbalance. And that power imbalance is not only reflected in the numbers configuration. That power imbalance becomes even more bothersome, more worrisome, when those who sit in majority numbers are weak men or weak women and will not stand up to power. Shall I repeat that, Mr. No, Speaker? Mr. Speaker, sir, on a point of clarification, sir. I remember, sir. My the Honorable Leader of the Opposition, sir, is suggesting that democracy is a threat in relation to the power imbalance in this place. But it is the power, it is democracy that determined the power imbalance in this place. It was through a full democratic process that the members in this place were elected through a democratic process by the people, sir. So to associate the structure and the composition of this place with anything undemocratic is to mislead the people, sir. I thank my honorable friend for his intervention, but he's a little bit off the mark. I'm not questioning the, the legitimacy of the process or the outcome of the exercise of that process. I am saying that in the face of the present configuration, which presents an evident imbalance of numbers and power, men must be strong and stand up in defense of democracy so that that power represented in those numbers do, does not feel itself unchecked and unbridled. That's all I'm saying. And men should be ready to their feet to say, no, that's not good. We should not have a two-year review with all of our people in there. That is an abuse of the power given by the force of numbers. That is what I'm saying. Don't, sir, keep quiet. Don't get me stirred. I'm trying to be... Ooh, and to bring this to an end. But when you come on subjects like these, we are dealing with realities here. We are dealing with reality. The media, the media, there is no bitterness here, Mr. Speaker. There is no bitterness here. There is concern for Barbados.
No, I hear I'm fishing. I hear, I hear I am fishing, Mrs. C. There's nothing wrong with, there's nothing wrong with the activity of fishing at all. There's nothing wrong with the activity of fishing. And if you're sensible, you go to fish where there's fish. If you're sensible, you go to fish where fish can be found or ought to be found. And let me repeat that because I see some getting stirred now. Come, let's get really. Yes. Numbers result from a legitimate process. But numbers can give such a level of comfort that some trans interpret that as license to do whatever they will. When that starts to happen, and it starts with first creeping steps, and when that starts to happen, men who are strong and women who are principled should stand up and say, come back. Should stand up and say, come back. Don't gnash your teeth and try to talk me down. Stand up and say, come back. Media has a role in this very dangerous period. The media has a role in this very dangerous period. You know what they say about power and its tendency to corrupt? You know what they say about total or absolute power? Yes. And we don't want to go there. Nobody is saying that we are there, Mr. Speaker. Simply saying that we have to be careful to be aware of the dangers to democracy and to say come back when we see those dangers beginning to show themselves. And the media needs to learn to report fairly. Everybody will have their biases and their party preference and all of that, but when you speak and you report, when you write, write as fairly as you professionally can. Media has a role to investigate and to follow through on matters. And so much is allowed to go a begging in Barbados to help safeguard our freedom, to highlight the dangers and the threats to that democratic process that gave a 30 nil defeat to the last administration. I've never otherwise than said it was 30. That was the result of the last election. It is not the configuration of the parliament now. And it may very well not be the configuration of parliament for the course of this term. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, why you warn these horrible men? No, no, look. Coming back, coming back, coming back, look. You see this honorable gentleman, this honorable gentleman from Christchurch in Central, and all this come back talk. Well, I, I will not go there. I am not going to trouble. I am not going to trouble him. I have quietly advised a couple of his colleagues, speak quietly to your ministerial colleague and ask him to stop, the, desist from trespassing on that line because it's improper and it's inappropriate. And I was going to speak about it, and I ain't going there. Because that's not my style of politics. But don't tell me about coming back. I would have thought that you would have given up on that by now. Because despite, despite your pleas and your prayers and your profferings, I'm still over here. And there are some things that all of you don't know. And there are some things that all of you do not know. And there are some things that some of you will never know. You've gone awfully quiet in the chamber, Mr. Speaker. Nobody making any noise right now. I have spoken in recent times about what I observe in my view to be a trend. And that has to do with the power being conferred on ministers and the power being concentrated in the hands of the Prime Minister, the Honorable Prime Minister. 
The last occasion I spoke to that in this house was at the time of the Emergency Powers Act, when the cabinet, when the cabinet amended a bill it had brought here to put absolute power in the hands of the Prime Minister, devolving the responsibility from themselves to one pair of hands. They did it as though they do, they do not have a sense of responsibility and a sense of judgment that can be trusted. That they cannot look at things with a sense of dispassion and maturity and make decisions. They devolve that responsibility to one pair of hands. On the Emergency Powers Act, this cabinet did that. And I'm saying, if you look back at legislation that we have brought here over the last year, within the last two years, you will see this trend emerging where power, either with respect to statutory corporations and how the administrative structures are changed and adjusted, how they're restructured, power goes to the minister to a point to approve, to dismiss, sole power. That's what the, the wording says, you know, sole power. A minister has a responsibility, a right, a power to create positions and to have those positions functional for some time. But we're talking about putting in the hands of a minister the power to approve disappointment or to dismiss an appointee. We did it in hospital, doing it at CBC, doing it all over the place. I remind you, I did not disagree when the matter was brought here for the appointment of the person who holds the position as CEO, that's what it's called. Didn't disagree with that. Because I think where people bring value to a situation, irrespective of who they are or to whom they are related, if they can get the job done, give them the job. I supported that. What I don't support is the power that is put in the hand of a minister to make appointments and to have people dismiss. That is too much power. The mechanisms that we put in place to deal properly, more transparently with that. And we do it with respect. To the Prime Minister. Look back at the legislation. You are the planning legislation, Mr. Speaker. There is a committee set up to give approvals to, 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 uh, for planning applications, and yet there's a provision in the legislation that with respect to certain, about 10 or 12 very significant areas, the power goes to the Prime Minister to overrule the position of the committee. You can come down through the place, down through the line, and look at the legislation. We've done it more than once. Put power in the hands of the Prime Minister. Put power in the hands of the Minister. Look, this administration today, that holds office, Mr. Speaker, may not be disposed to abuse any of those powers. Hear me very clearly. But you do not know the administration that comes tomorrow. This Pharaoh that rules over the land today may not be the Pharaoh. And I don't mean that in pejorative terms. I mean that simply in terms of a, a ruler, a position of rulership, a position of leadership. That's all I'm saying. The leader of today may not be the leader of tomorrow. And that is why we must get the legislation right, my honorable friend from St. Thomas. But strong men, when the chips are down, must stand up and declare that is the wrong path to take. Weak men who are fearful of their own well-being, whether that's professional well-being or otherwise. Weak men who are fearful that cabinet cuts might come or this might happen. Or, look, 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 look. Stand for principle. I don't want to get into that because I don't want to be part of that discussion. What the Prime Minister wants to do, she will do. If she feels it necessary to do so. I don't want to get into that. I've, I've not commented on those things. You've not heard me say it to know that the cabinet is too large. Not a single time. 
You've never heard me say that. Not a single time. The voices in the public are saying that. I don't want to be distracted, Mr. Speaker. All I'm saying is, when we are faced with a moment of truth, those who are not weak in the knees and those who are strong in the spirit and in the passion for the democracy and the democratic privileges that we live and try to promote, stand up and say, no, no, no. We need to hear a bit more of that. I didn't mean, Mr. Speaker, to be here for this long. But those things must be chewed upon. And I know, Mr. Speaker, that you are a thinking man and that you know where right and reason reflect themselves. And I simply offer to this chamber today CBC is not properly accounting for $2.8 million. I can't vote for a loan for them for $2.4 million. CBC is being abused, in my view, in terms of what it's allowed to do or in terms of what it's forced to do by the administration. And there are certain perils to our practice of democracy that I'm not going to subscribe to. And I encourage those who feel any measure of strength in their knees, any measure of fiber in their backbones. To, I'm not asking you to stand and say anything or even to vote against this. I'm simply saying if there's any measure of strength in your knees or any measure of fiber in your backbone, stand up sometimes and say, no, 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 no. We're doing this the wrong way. That's all. Don't all applaud at the same time, please. <laughs> Kirk? I really let up on business. Kirk? Mr. Speaker, um, I raise in support of the resolution. I raise in support of the resolution. Support given, sir, on the basis that the Caribbean Broadcasting Corporation, if you take all that has been said by the honorable member who just spoke, um, seems as though it is an organization which the Barbados Labor Party has been seeking to censor all other right-thinking members of this society. But on the other hand, sir, I, I understand that being in opposition often means that you have to oppose. But I do believe that you also have a responsibility to be honest and truthful. And in the same token, when you start to criticize policies or programs or you're in disagreement with what the current administration has put forward, you also have a responsibility to offer solutions, to offer recommendations, to put forward proposals from your own party to the country about how you see the transformation that may be necessary for a state-owned entity or for any other entity in this country, sir. What I heard, however, Mr. Speaker, on this particular resolution was what I consider to be what we would hear when we were in opposition, which is when you come in and you may not be too prepared for a speech, you decide to hold on to something, anything that you possibly can and make a speech out of it, sir. And it is with deep regret that the Honorable Member, while asking some valid questions regarding the finances of the organization, would also take this country and those listening on a journey that would convey the impression that the Barbados Labor Party, through the Caribbean Broadcasting Corporation, has in any way attempted to censor either himself or any other persons who are not associated with the Barbados Labour Party. The questions he has asked about why aren't more ministers perhaps on t television? Why is it that when we mount a, a, um, a conversation about the first two years in office, why was it not more fully represented by other persons? Sir, the Caribbean Broadcasting Corporation 
has had other persons speaking about the Barbados Labour Party's record. It has not censored anyone from being interviewed. It has not stopped anyone from being able to call in on programs. It has not stopped anyone from being able to mount their own program or pay for, serve for advertising time on CBC to be able to express their views or the views of their political organization. It hasn't done so. But to convey the impression that as a party that has made significant sacrifices of which the honorable member was once a part of, and who knows that on coming to office, the magnitude of the task that all of our members have had to face in dealing with respective ministries, I think it is unjust. I think it is unreasonable as I sit here and I listen to the honorable member for him to behave as though his former colleagues who are still respectful of him as an honorable member and leader of the opposition, that we would in any way through the Caribbean Broadcasting Corporation seek to censor him. He repeated over and over about how the media has a responsibility to do this and the media has a responsibility to do that. But what he didn't say at any juncture is how he, or what attempts he has made to participate in the programming on the Caribbean Broadcasting Corporation. I think what is happening is that he has now realized how difficult it is to financially fund an opposition party and to be able to put, get airtime on CBC or any other forum. And I think that is why I hear his frustrations coming out and I, I sympathize with him. Because it is not easy for any of us as members of this party either to deal with what is out there. Is the speaker, I don't remember it's misleading you That has nothing to do with anything that I said, but if she wants me to engage her now on this matter of funding politi political parties, we could go at that. Because there, there is a moral wrong that is going down in Barbados right now with respect to that. You want us to go down there? But, but. I remember that's not in Kilo. You want us to go out on there? That's not part of the resolution. I remember this. Pre precisely so. That's not part of the resolution. At precisely all. so. So don't come and mislead the host with that because we can go down that road and we can talk about the immoral act of the okay. Barbers Day Party taking all of the subvention, which could never have been intended by the framers of that thing. We can go down there. I remember that's not part of the resolution. And I, I will not permit that. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And, and again, I think the frustration is coming out because it cannot be easy for the honorable member to have to face and to walk this road almost alone in defense of what he is doing. It can't be easy. And we appreciate that. But I assure you that the Caribbean Broadcasting Corporation has in no way attempted to censor the honorable member, sir. It has no intention of so doing. What, however, is of concern is the fact that we have made attempts on coming to office to start the restructuring pro process of the Caribbean Broadcasting Corporation. I think a few months ago, um, we would have had the, the bill laid in the House in relation to a restructuring program that would see a chief operating officer, which would also see a chief executive officer being put in place. We accept that there are losses that the, the, the institution has sustained we understand that it requires some restructuring. We indicated then that yes, there would have to be losses as just as there have been losses across all sectors of the economy. But to paint a picture in this environment that in some way that there is some